Hi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Audrey Lim. I am uh, an editor here at Verso. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, this is so. This is Ashley Dawson right here. Um, Ashley, for the last couple of weeks, has been doing uh, a bunch of like events and talks around the city uh, for this new book, Extreme Cities: um, The Peril and Promise of Urban Life in the Age of Climate Change. Is that right? <laughs> wanted to make sure I got that exactly right. Um, but this is actually the official like launch event for the book. So I just want to say that uh, Verso is extremely proud to uh, publish this book. Um, I feel personally extremely honored to have um, had the privilege of uh, working on this book and editing it. Um, and I probably don't need to say much about why um, it's a pretty urgent book right now. I'll just like point to the fires and the floods that are, you know, raging around the, the globe right now. Um, and also remind folks that uh, next weekend, I think, is the fifth anniversary of uh, Hurricane Sandy already, um, for anybody who, you know, can still recall that very surreal moment in recent New York history. Um, so this book, this book is, um, I'll let you know, Ashley described the argument in uh, his own words in a moment, but it's, it's basically about how uh, the capitalist city and uh, the inequalities that sort of embody it, um, how that's not only uh, the main driver of climate change, but it's also uh, these cities are, uh, are gonna be the site of um, like the most devastating impacts of climate change. Um, in the future, but also, as we can see, right now. Um, so, uh, I, in just a moment, I'll like hand, I'll hand the mic over to everybody else, but uh, I'll just say, I guess, like one thing before I do that, which is that uh, the first time that um, I read the text, uh, I was uh, trying to approach it with like, um, like an objective, calm, neutral uh, editorial eye. Um, but of course I was like completely horrified. And you know, for like the next week, I was like that crazy person among my friends that was like, guys, guys, this is the end. Like, <laughs> we're all totally fucked. Um, and I should also say that I, I also do like climate journalism on the side. So I was already, you know, like familiar with uh, some of the things that Ashley was discussing, but I was still horrified. So I think that says something about the depth of his research and, uh, you know, the strength of his writing. Um, but, you know, as I, like, pulled myself together uh, and, you know, kept with the argument in the manuscript, I was, um, you know, I was really taken in by uh, his very, like, sober descriptions of um, not only like the roots of this like very immense crisis that we're in right now, um, but also, yeah, his very sober assessment of um, the kinds of like approaches and projects that people are already uh, beginning to undertake to try to, you know, mitigate the impacts of climate change um, in cities around the world. Um, and so, I mean, anybody that, that's like looking for a solution to the crisis, uh, like is not gonna find it in this book. That's, you know, that's like the billion dollar question. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I personally feel like, uh, you know, in these times of uh, like immense despair and like constant panic, uh, you know, I, I think of that as a kind of hope as well, so. Um, let me introduce the panelists. Um, so I actually have the descriptions on my phone. I'm not looking at Instagram, although I'm sure there's very interesting things going on there. Um, all right, so this is Ashley Dawson. Uh, he is a professor of English at the City University of New York and uh, the author of Extinction, A Radical History, uh, as well as Extreme Cities Now. Uh, this here is uh, Kate Aronoff. Uh, she's a writing fellow at In These Times, uh, covering the politics of climate change, the White House transition, and uh, the resistance to Trump's agenda. Um, and she's also now a contributing writer uh, at The Intercept, and I would strongly encourage people 
um, to read her recent writing on like the political and economic context of the crisis in Puerto Rico right now, um, as well as her older writing on like cooperative models of you know renewable energy generation um, and whatnot, which I've learned a lot from. Um, and this here is uh, Mandy Eckert, who is head of uh, C40's Adaptation and Water Initiative, uh, which is responsible for supporting cities in meeting their goals around climate change adaptation and water management. Um, and in the past, Mandy has served as uh, the organization's Jakarta City Director um, through the C40 partnership uh, with the Clinton Climate Initiative. Um, and before joining the organization, uh, Mandy was a city planner in New York as well. So I'm you know, especially excited to hear uh, from her about the different um, experiments and initiatives in climate, climate ad adaptation um, that are already happening around the globe. So now I'll shut up. Um, to begin with, maybe uh, Ashley, you could begin by uh, explaining what you mean by extreme cities. Okay, um, well first of all, uh, hi everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight on a Friday night. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Please let me know if you can't. Um, <coughs> it's really a dream come true to have published this book with Verso. Um, I've admired Verso for uh, a long time, <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, such an honor to be publishing with Verso and to be here tonight. Um, so I wanted to start out by saying that, and I also wanted to thank my fellow, fellow panelists for agreeing to be in dialogue. I'm really excited to have a conversation um, with all of you. Uh, so, Extreme Cities, the title. I wanted to get at the conjunction of two things with that title, planetary urbanization on the one hand and climate change, right? So um, the extremity of cities is quite evident to all of us who are following contemporary economics, right? Um, mi middle class incomes in uh, wealthy countries have been um, uh, more or less the same for many decades. Cities have been colonized by capitalism, there's increasing gentrification, displacement, and of course, violence against marginalized communities um, in cities uh, in the global north. And at the same time, in the global south, because of free trade agreements um, uh, that have battered down uh, regime forms of um, controls for uh, agriculture and to sustain peasant livelihoods, people have been pushed off the land and have settled in cities, okay? So we've got uh, increasingly in, increasing inequality both in cities of the global north and the global south. Um, and at the same time, as Audrey mentioned, we know that cities are generating climate change. About 70% of carbon emissions result from cities, right? So we have massive urbanization happening. It's a kind of polarized economically and socially form of urbanization. And it's also urbanization which is driving climate change. And then um, when large numbers of people are in cities and the cities are unequal, when a storm or um, you know, a heat wave or some other form of extreme weather hits, unequal populations are extremely vulnerable. So you have this kind of conjunction of different kinds of extremity which reinforce one another. And that's the dynamic that I really wanted to get to with the idea of extreme cities. Um, and I guess connected to that, one of the things that you write about in the book is um, that the, the unnatural disaster, and mm -hmm. that there's like no such thing as a natural disaster, um, and, you know, with all these disasters going on all around the world right now. Um, could you just kind of explain that and unpack what you mean? Well, sure. Um, we are becoming increasingly aware as a result of the work that scientists have done of the extent to which um, you know, former natural disasters can actually be attributed to anthropogenic climate forcing of various different kinds. So, you know, even if um, storms are not necessarily increasing in um, frequency as a result of climate change, the uh, severity and the intensity of the storms is increasing and all of that is, uh, you know, we can understand it as a result of science. So there's, there's that element, right? That um, while nature, I would say, does have a kind of autonomy and in the book I talk about environmental 
blowback. Nonetheless, we're forcing it, uh, or humanity is forcing it in certain ways um, and making it more extreme. And then as I was already mentioning, um, social polarization and inequality is leading to increasing vulnerability of populations. So in every different aspect of a disaster, um, kind of social construction leads to uh, particular outcomes that are um, particularly savage and that reinforce inequalities, right? So not just when a storm or some other form of extreme weather is hitting a city, but also um, in the process of reconstructing um, a city, right? When uh, the idea of returning to some baseline, um, you know, building things back l leads to actual uh, increase of inequality, which you know, was already a factor before storms hit and which increased uh, forms of vulnerability in the course of storm damage. Um, so yeah, there's that sort of sense that a disaster really has to be thought of as um, unnatural and that if we're going to mitigate um, these disasters, we need to deal with the underlying social factors that lead to vulnerability. Um, and I'm wondering how you would sort of apply that to any number of the uh, disasters that uh, we're looking at right now, for instance, like Puerto Rico, or maybe you could say something about that. If you... <laughs> sure, yeah, I'll jump in then, and would love to hear what, um, what Ashley has to say. Um, yeah, I mean, Puerto Rico, it's hard to really understand what's happening in, in Puerto Rico right now without at least a sort of basic understanding of the recent and less recent history uh, of the island. So. Uh, as, as folks might be, you know, aware to varying degrees, the uh, Puerto Rico is currently under um, the governance of something called PROMESA, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly the acronym now, but uh, is, uh, was a bill passed by Congress last summer and established this thing called a Fiscal Oversight Board, um, which has total control over uh, the island's finances. This is somewhat similar to what we've seen uh, in different towns around uh, Michigan. People are probably familiar with what happened in Flint uh, around emergency management. Atlantic City is also under emergency management. And so uh, to the extent that Puerto Rico was a colony before of the United States, PROMESA itself is a really colonial body uh, in a way that, that colonialism gets thrown around a lot, I think, in, in, in some spaces on the left. But there's no other way, I think, to accurately um, describe what's happening in Puerto Rico. And so what was going on? Uh, well before the, the storm, the, the hurricane hit, um, there have been several storms, I think, um, in, in Puerto Rico, um, were all of these different sorts of storms. Um, so there was a storm, of course, first of colonialism uh, and, and of an island sort of having its, uh, its autonomy taken away, its democratic processes. Um, and then there was the storm of, of Wall Street really coming in. Uh, and that's, you know, you can, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about the causes of, of Puerto Rico's financial crises and, and other social crises. Um, but uh, Wall Street in particular, I think, holds a special blame for engineering specifically um, damaging and borderline illegal forms of debt. Um, and so I won't go too far into this, but um, engineered forms of debt, which, which specifically were meant to uh, exceed the island's borrowing limit um, and lead Puerto Rico to a place now of being at least uh, at least $74 billion in debt. I say at least because we actually don't know um, how much debt there is. Um, and uh, much of that is also an in interest um, as a result of sort of these, these repayment uh, terms. So in terms of how that relates to um, the hurricanes, just briefly, um, Puerto Rico has been living in a state of austerity for a very long time, um, most markedly um, since last summer when this fiscal oversight board was installed. Uh, and so when a storm comes in, you have infrastructure being hit that has been disinvested from for not just the last year, but the last several decades um, as a result of sort of patterns of capitalism and many of the similar sort of dynamics that have happened um, in very, very different ways, obviously in New York, um, but that you see happening sort of all over the world and, and, and showing up um, really sort of pointedly in, in Puerto Rico. And so the, the most sort of obvious example of this is PREPA, the Puerto Rico um, Electric Power Authority, um, which was in near total disrepair. Um, before the storm hit, it had been uh, knocked out, about 70% of, of Puerto Rico's power had been knocked out um, a couple weeks before with Hurricane Irma. 
uh, summer before that, or the September before that, um, power had gone out for a huge swath of the island for basically no reason um, other than austerity. Um, and so you have all of these sort of factors combining uh, and, and you know, deep, deep poverty in Puerto Rico, of course, um, to make the storm that hits uh, on top of being stronger, um, as you mentioned, um, much deeper, the, make the impact of that much deeper um, and much more catastrophic than it would have been. There's no, um, there's no reason why a storm uh, in, in actual fact needs to uh, cause death, cause suffering, cause you know, people's lives to be torn apart, cause whole governments to be torn apart. Um, but the way that uh, you know, these, these uh, places are constructed where these storms hit um, are particularly vulnerable in many ways. And coastal communities, I think, have a, a sort of particular vulnerability that I would love to yeah, hear you talk about. Um, in the book, uh, I sort of, um, I talk a lot about New York my experience during Hurricane Sandy, the experience of other people during Hurricane Sandy. I, I also travel to many other cities, but I keep kind of coming back to New York City. So let me give you one example from New York. Um, a good, good example of um, kind of induced urban vulnerabilities uh, is the, the Rockaways, which was one of the hardest hit areas um, during Hurricane Sandy. I'm sure many of you remember, some of you may have been out there to volunteer um, in the uh, days and weeks after Hurricane Sandy. There's a long history of uh, the social construction of the Rockaways, uh, going all the way back to the infamous Robert Moses, um, who cited the vast majority of the borough of Queens public housing projects in the far Rockaways. Um, so it was essentially a kind of warehousing of the poor and of communities of color out in the Rockaways, about as far away as you could get from the rest of, of the borough. And then when um, Hurricane Sandy hit, many of the um, official relief organizations refused to go into some of the public housing buildings because of you know, social misconceptions about the people there, essentially, you know, kind of racialized fears about people living in public housing. So I interviewed <clears throat> Occupy Sandy activists who were some of the only people who were going in, who were helping people who needed water because, you know, when the power goes out in New York City, if you live above the fifth floor, you don't have access to any water, you know, drinking water or any water to get rid of sewage. Um, people who um, were elderly and who needed uh, drugs but didn't have any access to medications um, uh, and were not getting the help from official relief agencies like the Red Cross. Um, so, you know, these are just a, a few examples of how a, a very long history of social marginalization and inequality then impacts on people in the course of a crisis. So you have a kind of overlap of what I would call sort of forms of slow violence and inequality against populations with you know, these forms of uh, disaster that strike and that reveal those inequalities um, uh, to the rest of the world. Although, of course, to people in the Rockaways, this is a, an ongoing crisis and something that's not invisible by any means. Um, and then to come back very quickly to um, your question about current events, Audrea, um, there was a lot of reporting uh, after Hurricane Harvey hit Houston about how suburban development had leveled a lot of the wetlands um, in the city's uh, outer regions and how that led to extreme flooding uh, because those wetlands would have absorbed a lot of the intense rainfall that Hurricane Harvey brought. If you remember, the hurricane was characterized less by, I mean, every hurricane is different. Um, hurricane Harvey was characterized less by extremely strong winds than by really torrential and ongoing downpours. Um, so th the wetlands might have served to absorb um, some of the flooding. Uh, so there's a story there of capital and re real estate development, and, and that's kind of, as Audrea explained, is central to uh, the book and to some of the contradictions in urban space and society that I trace. What got into the news less, I think, is the way in which there's a history of um, racial segregation and um, uh, discrimination in Houston, which also played a role, right, because um, of the way in which uh, communities of color in Houston uh, were redlined, not uh, permitted to live in certain areas of the city uh, in the post-war period uh, during the era of Jim Crow. Um, and when they moved further away from the city, the city refused to connect them up to its infrastructure. So a lot of the um, uh, infrastructure that existed was, you know, not 
capable of absorbing the flood waters. It was essentially sort of ditches on the side of the road rather than any kind of real storm um, sewer system. Um, and so a lot of the flooding that happened uh, was particularly intense in um, working class communities of color. Um, so that's just one example. And obviously there are myriad other issues that one could talk about in relation to Houston, particularly uh, siting of uh, petrochemical um, industry in communities of color. But um, that's, a, that's enough for now in, in uh, response to your question, I think, Audrea. Do you have anything you want to add? Well, I think related. I mean, I'm, I'm not too across on the Caribbean flooding focusing on some of the larger cities of the world, the mega cities of the world. But I will say, um, with our group, the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, which is right now not 40 as it once was, but 91 cities, that 63 of them this year have reported to us that they were hit by some extreme weather event. And some of them we've seen in the news, like Houston or Mumbai or Dhaka, but, but others are equally experiencing drought conditions, you know, water shortage. Uh, storm conditions, landslides, a variety of, of ways that they characterize them as climate-related events. And so for us this year, I'd say with NC40, it's been a real wake-up call that this is seems to be moving faster than we had previously thought. And so I think one thing, Ashley, that you mentioned in your book that I'm really keen to learn more about is how you know, the IPCC projections have been very conservative and have erred on the side of conservatism so as not to um, you know, compromise the integrity of the science or to panic um, urban <laughs> dwellers and, and city environments. And these are the predictions about like the, ra the rate of like sea level rise and... Right? And storms, yeah, the, the <coughs> rates that our oceans are increasing in temperature and thus causing, you know, more, more tropical storms, um, storm surge, drought conditions that then, you know, are, are connected. I think you also mentioned the kind of floating rivers in the Amazon and how those water sources, those rain sources, end up feeding cities like Sao Paulo and Rio and how they rely on that water and how the climate conditions are actually affecting kind of the, the rural or the hinterland and, and thus affecting the cities. So I think for us, um, you know, I'll honestly say that I think our cities that we work with, the mayors or their city agencies, still feel quite new to climate adaptation. Uh, the C40 group was founded only 10 years ago, and really it focused primarily on greenhouse gas mitigations because the group is started by the mayor of London, then Ken Livingston, or Red Ken, as some of you might know him, um, you know, felt very much that national governments weren't doing enough. It's very much true, I think, in many cases still today. And so this group collectively um, came together to say, okay, well, well, we're going to pledge to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Really only over the last two or three years, or I'll say since Sandy, which I think, I know this sounds a little cynical, but I think was a blessing to the rest of the world that Sandy hit New York and hit one of the wealthiest cities in the world, where then the rest of the world realized, oh, it's not just what we might consider to be you know, developing cities that don't have capacity and resource, or cities that have you know, corrupt systems that are siphoning money away from needed infrastructure or social uh, services projects. But if a city as great as New York um, is also as vulnerable, then, then so are we. So it really woke up a lot of the cities in, in the C40 organization, and I think worldwide, to say we need to be serious about climate adaptation. We're not invulnerable because you know we feel protected. Um, One of the things um, I really like uh, in this book is the way that you talk about Sandy and uh, how, I mean, you talk about how it impacts New York, but also um, Haiti. And that really highlights how, um, on the one hand, you know, like a city as great as New York um, can also, you know, be like plunged into darkness uh, for an entire week. Um, but at the same time, um, it really also, like the unevenness with which like these disasters hit different places, it really just highlights um, like the un uneven nature of like development in these places and sort of how it intersects with like racial justice or immigrant justice issues. Um, do you wanna maybe say something more about that? Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to, um, this the kind of introductory chapter that Audrey is alluding to um, where I sort of start off with my own experience in my apartment in Jackson Heights during Hurricane Sandy where um, the 
water was coming in through the wall, so this giant blister formed on the wall, and it was a very kind of Kafka-esque experience, but you know, not in any way life-threatening. Um, uh, and, and then I kind of expand to other parts of the city, um, including uh, Staten Island, where, where I teach. Um, and as chair of the English department there, you know, I had to go in and make sure that the English department was still functioning, which involved um, you know, connecting with students, many of whom you know, had, had lost their houses, and in some cases, their, their loved ones. So you know, the disparity across the city was very, very evident to me. But then I wanted to expand even beyond that to, to Haiti, which Hurricane Sandy hit. And you know, there were many people um, in the tent city uh, in Port-au-Prince uh, after, after the earthquake, um, and they were still living there during Hurricane Sandy. And so you know, these ferocious winds and rains buffeted people who were in extremely vulnerable conditions. And, and I wanted to expand like that because um, First of all, I, I think there's a problem in the way that the news media re represents weather, although obviously weather systems um, go across all sorts of different boundaries. Weather tends to get represented in national terms. You know, we might get a quick mention of what's happening somewhere else, but the kind of human interest stories are all too often uh, very parochial and uh, quite nationalistic, and so I wanted to challenge that. But then the obvious other reason is that I was writing about New York City, the capital of capital, right, and what New York City does. At, as you were talking about before, Kate, you know, um, has a, a really disproportionate effect on the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, New York's uh, export of capital um, and the role it plays um, in neoliberal globalization has a very, very strong impact in creating the kinds of vulnerabilities that we've been discussing. Um, uh, However, just to come back very quickly, you asked me about other cities and what's going on in other cities. So um, one of the other, I, I did try to be quite global um, and I didn't stop with Haiti, went to some uh, other cities around the world and talked about them in quite a lot of detail. One of them was Jakarta, um, the capital of Indonesia. Um, and actually Mandy has lived in Jakarta, um, so I'd, I'd love to, hear her take on um, what's happening in Jakarta. Uh, what I wrote about was the fact that um, the city authorities are building a huge kind of dike um, or um, uh, a levee in front of uh, the seacoast, um, in front of the coast itself, which is in the shape of a kind of mythical bird, a Garuda. That's why it's called the Great Garuda. Um, so a bit like some of the kind of islands that you see in some of the United Arab Emirates, inspired by that, I think. Um, and it's sold, so this thing is being sold as some kind of protection for coastal regions that might be threatened by rising seas and typhoons. And yet it's also a huge real estate boggle, uh, boondoggle, right? Because um, you know, local and also international elites are being sold luxury condominiums on this constructed island. Um, uh, meanwhile, the island is going to create a, a lagoon, um, of course, you know, uh, between itself and the mainland. Uh, and since there's only one functioning um, sewage treatment plant in a city of over 20 million people with 14 different rivers going through it, that lagoon is essentially gonna become a giant pool of shit, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, I talked about Jakarta and what was happening there to show the kinds of contradictions that are playing out as capital, you know, tries to invest in real estate while also talking about climate protection and climate proofing. And I, I, I trace this in many different cities, New York included. And I'll just respond to that because it's true. I, I uh, lived and worked in Jakarta for the governor, two governors ago, so Fauzi Bowo, if any of you know who he was. When I was there, we were really just focusing on greenhouse gas reduction, so I wasn't involved in the, the large coastal project that Ashley's mentioning. But I think um, my take of that project, which I know is still very much the ambition of the Jakarta city government and the national government, um, is that they are very much looking to the Netherlands as their model. You know, Jakarta or Batavia even before was settled as a Dutch colony, and so they were built on, you know, land recapture with canal systems, and they had a pumping system that very much emulated the way the operations worked in the Netherlands. Now, as Ashley mentions, Jakarta has boomed into a huge mega city um, with very little planning and land use controls or hydrological security measures. So I think 
the grand ambition of this coastal seawall and the land value recapture program where they're hoping, you know, as they do in Singapore also, to create more land so that they can sell it and make more money to invest in the project that they need to do the proper pumping or water treatment is, is the concept behind that. Um, but what it means is that you get a lot of, you know, speculative real estate and there have been issues of corruption with, with this case, certainly. The basic engineering of the project, it might have worked out. The main barrier, as I see it, is not even the corruption, but the fact that, also as Ashley mentioned, there's, there's no um, proper sewage treatment within the city. There's no fresh water supply to most of the city. So as the fresh water from the, from the river's pool at the bottom um, of, in this reservoir, indeed, it will probably create the giant cesspool. And the major reason for that, I see it, is that there's not a lot of coordination within the city government between the different city agencies. It's largely managed by the national government, but even the, the sewage department isn't really connected with the water department or the land use department on this. So there's not the comprehensive planning that really needs to go into a large project like this to even make it work. So the city continues to sink as people need to extract well water for, for basic water consumption. Um, increasing the, the salinity of the groundwater, causing future destabilization of the soil. So there's many complicated reasons that this project isn't working, and indeed it is affecting and will affect the, um, you know, the socially most vulnerable. Um, so that is a very good case in point for your, for your book. That said, Jakarta is also trying to work on more solutions that they can control in terms of you know, greening the riverbanks, replanting, what this means for livelihoods, and, and looking at income generation activities, whether it can be from selling and producing bamboo furniture or other potential crops, or, or what other kinds of actual livelihoods can be based on, on the rivers. Um, so we continue to work to support Jakarta, even though they've had some political turnovers uh, recently. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting that you mention, or you sort of like, hint at the need for comprehensive planning at the same time as like uh, these efforts uh, at climate mitigation are really actually like opportunities for um, private investors um, to develop property. Um, and I mean, most of the, I, I think most of our conversations around um, just this process are, are more about uh, um, privatization efforts like in moments of disaster or right after? I mean, you've written a little bit about uh, what, what that's looking like right now in Puerto Rico. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I, I have a follow-up question that I, I want to make sure I note for myself to, to ask Ashley about this, um, sort of on the, on the flip side of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, you would think sort of looking at, at what's happened in Houston, what's happened in Florida, what's happened in, in Puerto Rico, just like as a sort of thinking person, not even like a particularly left person, though I'm sure, you know, I identify that way, I'm sure many people in this audience do. Um, you would think that it would not make objective sense to rebuild some of these cities or states in some cases, in, in, in a case like Florida, um, the way that they've been built before, um, particularly when it comes to electric utilities. Um, electric utilities are, are horribly vulnerable um, to storms, the way they're structured now. Um, all of the generation is hyper-centralized. That's just how sort of fossil fuel generation works, is that if one, uh, trend, if, if a transmission line goes out, um, 10,000 people lose power. And so even if you don't have sort of a moral or ethical commitment to renewable energy, if climate change isn't something you think about, um, you, you would sort of imagine that that's how uh, a, a storm vulnerable community, state, city, what have you, uh, would rebuild. And you've written more recently about this as well and, and touch on it in the book too. Um, that is not at all what's happening uh, <laughs> in, in any of these places. Um, I think there, there are people who are interested in that, but, but what you see, where you see more capital going um, is toward rebuilding either uh, exactly what existed before or worse um, than what existed before. So uh, if you look at Puerto Rico, which I've, I've been spending um, 
a decent amount of time thinking about recently, um, the US Army Corps of Engineers is sort of in charge of the rebuilding effort. It's the largest rebuilding effort they've done. Um, and there's really very little transparency about what they're doing, but we're starting to see sort of the results of these contracts that they're allowed to, um, that they're allowed to hand out largely to American companies, um, largely to rebuild fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so there's sort of like a coterie of agencies who are involved at this point. Um, the US Army Corps of Engineers is sort of heading things up. The Department of Energy is involved to some extent. Then there's PREPA, um, the utility there, which uh, has its own sort of corruption issues that are apart from privatization efforts. Um, talk about that afterwards. Um, but these contracts are going, A, to, to firms that in large part don't have much experience um, doing this sort of thing and are um, sent to rebuild, rebuild the thing that, that existed before um, and probably will not do a very good job. One of the contractors that PREPA brought in, um, PREPA leadership, who, which has been heavily criticized by the utility workers union there, um, is a company called Whitefish Energy, which is based in Montana um, and has two employees who uh, on paper are related, but they're not giving interviews. Um, so we don't know uh, <laughs> what their relationship is, if they're husband or wife, if they're uh, brother and sister, what have you. Um, one of them is a registered nurse. Um, the other has some experience in power lines. They had one uh, contract with the Department of Energy um, prior to this, and they were founded two years ago. Um, so this is who is rebuilding Puerto Rico's grid at this point. And there are other companies involved. There are larger companies. There are natural gas companies um, coming in. Uh, but it really is a sort of opportunity, and, and, and you see this process happening. I mean, Naomi Klein obviously talks about this in the shock doctrine, but it's just very blatant in part because uh, a lot of these places don't think that people are paying attention to Puerto Rico because historically um, that has, has not been... Uh, been the case, but you know, it, it's something, a, a phrase that gets used a lot to talk about um, many other things that happen on the island is, is vulture capitalism. But I think in order to really understand what's happening there and just the whole array of actors that are uh, involved in this situation, you need a sort of more expansive understanding of, of predatory birds um, to uh, grasp what's going on if we want to stick with that metaphor or we can invent a different one. But um, there, there are just so many actors and that's only, I, I was only talking about energy. I mean, that's not even to get into the sort of gentrification which is likely to happen there. Um, and, and this new sort of elements which are very likely to, to spring up. Yeah, vultures get a, a bad rap. They're actually <laughs> really wonderful um, parts of ecosystems um, <laughs> uh, and, and important and endangered in many ways. Um, uh, Audrey, you said um, before that I, I, the book doesn't provide any solutions to these ghastly problems that we've been talking about. I wanted to say that I added an epilogue after you see, saw the book where I give all the solutions. So, um, no, no. <laughs> Not really. Um, so you but guys should all rush out to, yes. <laughs> Don't to me. I, I do think that um, there are a lot of different solutions that people are talking about and kind of alternatives to these grim dynamics that we've been identifying. Um, in the book, you know, I talk about the real rebuild by design competition where a whole series of top architectural firms put forward ideas for climate proofing New York. Um, I offer a kind of critique of some of those proposals, even though there are many aspects of them that I want to celebrate and that seem very forward thinking and kind of shifting away from the Army Corps of Engineers, kind of, you know, let's armor the coasts and let's think about ecosystems in little chunks rather than far more holistically. So I think there's a lot to be celebrated and a lot of forward thinking uh, sort of efforts to adapt cities going on. But the main reason that I'm critical about those kinds of efforts is that. Um, they're very different from what I found uh, coming out of environmental justice movements here in New York and in other parts of the world, where there's a kind of sense that the need to adapt cities um, and to engage in kind of um, adaptive mitigation or forms of adaptation that also diminish carbon emissions is a huge opportunity for cities, you know? If, um, populations that have been economically marginalized, socially marginalized, could be put at the forefront of climate-proofing cities, you know, um, uh, then there would be the possibility for real transformation. And so, you know, groups in the South Bronx, for instance, that were critical of some of the rebuild by design 
programs were critical quite precisely because they didn't include education programs, apprenticeship programs, and guarantees of employment at a living wage for people engaging in post-Sandy reconstruction. So I think those kinds of arguments are the key arguments to keep in mind when we're thinking about not just sort of disaster capitalism and all the bad things that are happening, but also how we might sort of think about a Green New Deal or whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the task of really climate proofing global cities where the majority of humanity now lives as a huge political and economic and, and kind of um, civilizational opportunity to sort of re-knit the, the bonds that have been tearing us apart. Could you just, um, for anybody who doesn't know what the Rebuild by Design uh, competition was, could you maybe just describe like one of the more forward thinking um, projects? Yeah, sure, sure. So Rebuild by Design was a competition sponsored initially by the Rockefeller Foundation, but then the US um, Department of Housing and Urban Development got involved, providing almost a billion dollars to a series of firms um, and their proposed initiatives here in New York City. Um, there were five top prize winners, and in the book I talk about each of the projects in quite a lot of detail. Um, for me, the most compelling one was the uh, one by Kate Orff and the Escape Studio, which involved using um, oyster reefs off the coast of Staten Island to uh, act as a kind of um, barrier to storm surges, which Staten Island is extremely vulnerable to. You know, those were some of the hard, most hard hit portions of the city during Hurricane Sandy. So the idea is that um, to use these oyster reefs because oysters purify water, you know, they can be harvested, providing occup uh, an occupation and um, livelihood for people, but also um, oysters grow organically. So as waters in increase in height, the reefs themselves could rise up um, and provide an organic form of protection for the coast. Um, so I thought that was a really good example of trying to work with nature rather than you know just creating some kind of uh, a hard barrier. Which you know, um, as we have come to see in many cases, building those hard barriers is always a problem because first of all, it creates a false sense of security um, for people. So you know, you get real estate development right beh behind the barrier, and then often those barriers, because of economic considerations, are not high enough, right? And we've got subsidence, as Mandy mentioned, as a huge issue for global cities around the world. Um, and of course, sea level rise and stronger storm surges and also riverine flooding, you know, as we get stronger precipitation, the, the, the threats are coming not just from the oceans, but also from the rivers that are flowing through cities. And often those two things are happening at once. And so if you create a wall to protect you from the ocean, often that wall can just either be overtopped um, or else flooded as rivers um, flood. So yeah, um, using these kinds of natural barriers I thought was a really interesting proposal. Um, my critique of it is that, well, you know, the oceans are acidifying and uh, oyster populations are crashing around the world. So um, even these very kind of progressive um, uh, proposals really have to confront the very dystopian future that we're making for ourselves unless we stop um, emitting carbon. And so then what are the kinds of um, solutions uh, or like models that uh, environmental justice groups are advocating for um, that would not only deal with um, sort of climate change, but also like social, uh, racial, gender, uh, economic inequality, injustice? Right, in the book I talk about We Act, uh, which as I'm sure many of you know, is an environmental justice organization based in, in Harlem, and they released a climate action plan. Um, when I wrote about it, it was only a two-page kind of booklet, but um, if you go on the web, you can, you can find it now. It's now about a 60-page book, so they've expanded the details that I talk about. But for me, it was one of the most kind of interesting and forward-thinking efforts to think in the kind of short to medium term about what to do. So they talk about things like, um, uh, you know, climate education and storm centers, places that would be social hubs for people to gather in the event of a disaster, but which would also help to cohere communities um, in the meantime and to 
help educate people about what the threats are. So the kind of building on the perception that social cohesion is absolutely central to surviving in the face of kind of slow onset disasters, like for instance, the heat island effect, which is one of the leading causes of death, you know, not destruction from a hurricane um, in urban settings, um, as well as, you know, more, um, uh, uh, spectacular um, and devastating forms of natural disasters like typhoons. Um, uh, and in addition to that, the Climate Action Plan talks about shifting to renewable energy. Um, as Kate was saying, you know, there's this uh, sense which I think many social movements around the world are recognizing, and that is that um, the kind of grassroots, bottom-up, people-powered movements can use renewable energy and control of renewable energy to also create decentralized networks of, of power in both senses of the term that will not be knocked out when the grid goes down, right? So that's another very prominent component of the plan. And then, of course, the plan calls for, you know, uh, employment of people in Harlem to make these big transitions to uh, kind of green um, uh, infrastructure in, in the city. Um, Looking more um, long term, I think communities um, that are in the front lines of climate change are increasingly thinking about issues of just retreat. And that's another thing I talk about in the book. I talk to anthropologists working with indigenous communities in uh, Alaska, in, in towns like Shishmarev, which uh, are, are really seeing massive impacts of climate change, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, the uh, Arctic region is actually experiencing some of the most fast-moving um, changes as a result of climate change. And so people are seeing uh, the um, permafrost melting, which once protected their villages from um, the, the oceans and from storm surges, and parts of their villages are being washed away. So they've been calling for support from state authorities, <clears throat> um, both state of Alaska, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and then also you know, the, the US government to have a kind of managed and just retreat for those communities, which would you know, really be planned from the bottom up rather than imposed from the top down, because we know there's a, a horrible history of you know, forced displacement, which the government has perpetrated against indigenous people and, and many others um, in, in cities. Uh, in other parts of the United States. So, you know, I think we need to think about sort of temporal scales and, you know, plans um, across a variety of different time spans. Can I, I want to ask about that also because I think some of the ideas that you presented in the book are things that our cities are trying to work on, um, but I wonder if they're too incremental right now. I think, you know, as you mentioned, WEAC's proposal for job training and awareness building. I know New York City has been trying to run a cool roofs program where they have a job training component. So it's supposed to green economy and, and welfare in South Bronx and some of the hottest communities. And Ashley, where you're from in Cape Town and in Durban in South Africa, I know they're trying to do more job creation programs around, well, Cape Town that has such significant drought conditions um, with training community plumbers that can go into people's homes and try to fix any leaks and really inform people about water usage and you know limiting each person's water usage, whereas in, in Durban, it's kind of the opposite, where they're employing community members to clean up riverways, um, you know, so that they don't get as as jammed and as blocked and, and flooded. And then there's the economic incentive of well as well, which then just completely shuts down all of Durban's port activity. But in any case, I wonder if these kinds of job um, uh, training, education, employment programs are enough, or as you mentioned about the retreat, which I think some cities are considering more and more. Cities that I'm working with don't, no one has yet said, we're going to just pick up and move entirely. There's a lot of cultural heritage and economic and many other reasons why that hasn't become a main topic of discussion yet. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the um, bits of research that you note in the book that I thought was really enlightening for me and that I'm looking forward to working on with some of my colleagues and, and cities is that the migration patterns that we're seeing globally is people moving from drought, um, agricultural areas experiencing drought, to urban coastal cities that are experiencing flood. So regardless of what the risk is, they're moving from one risk-prone scenario to another for economic opportunities and, and for jobs. 
So I'm just wondering, as you give this example in Alaska, is this a feasible scenario uh, around the world? And who is the actor, or who needs to know this to get people either to stop moving or give them another option? And you know, who really needs to call the shots? Is it is it a mayor? Is it national government? Is it some consortium? Like, who do you think the power player that there can be to help resolve these really destructive migration? Patterns. Kate, did you want to ask? Yeah, I have a very related question just to tap off, tack onto that, um, which is that I, I thought one of the, the really interesting concepts you dive into um, in a full chapter, if I remember right, of the book is, is um, this concept of disaster communism um, mm -hmm. and that uh, in the wake of disasters, these sort of networks pop up um, of self sufficiency of people really meeting needs, um, and often cases when the state is absent. Um, and, and this is particularly relevant if you've been paying attention to um, storm response recently. Um, so, you know, about this question of sort of where, you know, who is making these decisions, who is, is sort of planning, I'm, I'm wondering what you see as the balance between um, those sorts of things and kind of decentralized grassroots approaches. Um, not just to disaster response, but to um, renewable energy. I mean, there is like a version of microgrids and, and a version of, um, of renewable development, which looks very decentralized. So what do you see as a balance between those sorts of things um, and uh, this massive planning question of um, how do we actually prepare cities and create you know, some sort of ideally holistic plan to um, retreat from centers of capital in the, in, in the case of the United States of, you know, is, is Wall Street going to relocate to Denver? Like, who is, who is figuring that out? Is it Lloyd Blankfein or is it um, Mayor de Blasio? Right, <laughs> like, right. Or the mayor of Denver, whoever that is. Wow, those are really big questions. And, and I know we want to open things for um, questions and discussion with the audience. So I'll, I'll try and respond as quickly as I can. Um, yeah. Solving the world's biggest crisis I know, right? in, in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, figure it out like, in the next time. <laughs> um, disaster communism, um, the, the title of the chapter obviously is intended as a polemical riposte to Naomi Klein's idea of disaster capitalism. Um, what I did um, in that chapter was to talk to um, uh, some absolutely amazing activists in the Occupy Sandy. Um, and uh, what I found in my interviews with them is that they really bore out some of Rebecca Solnit's arguments in Paradise Made in Hell about how, you know, when the normal hegemonic social arrangements are suspended because of some kind of disaster, people don't devolve into some kind of Mad Max, you know, zombie attack violence against one another, but actually people end up um, engaging in forms of human solidarity and um, supporting one another through m mutual aid. So um, it was a really wonderful story, but then what I found in speaking to these activists, if I'm not mischaracterizing them, was that as um, sort of disaster relief efforts shifted into rebuilding, the existing power networks began to reassert themselves. And Ness organizations had, or like Occupy Sandy, were able to link up with more long-standing organizations that had really deep roots in communities and that had existing ways of pushing um, government and uh, state organizations, they often got marginalized, right? So all of that comes around to an argument on my part essentially against the kind of left, I would argue, sort of fetishization of horizontalism today and you know, saying that essentially um, leftists are gonna have to think about making claims on, on the state and pushing the state for transformation given the extent of the crisis that is going to unfold and that for many people is already unfolding. And this is to come to Mandy's question. I mean, one of the chapters is called Climate Apartheid. And I, I talk about the fact that for some time, the environmental movement used the, uh, this is in, in, the, in the West, you know, in the, in the rich countries, used uh, what I would call the specter of <coughs> climate refugees in order to say, we need to mitigate now or else we'll have you know, hordes of people coming from the global south. And so I, I trace how that kind of implicitly racist um, rhetoric got taken over by increasingly the military industrial complex, which you know, as we know with Trump in power now, you know, it's all about um, militarizing the borders, militarizing our cities, and making connections between imperial wars overseas and policing operations uh, in our country. And of course, Trump is not the first to do that, obviously. Um, Obama and the Democrats were pursuing that um, uh, uh, long before Trump 
uh, arrived on the stage. Um, so, you know, I think people are moving. There is a mass social movement to shift, um, uh, and that's going to be essentially unstoppable. So, you know, how do we, um, as uh, anti racists and anti imperialists, make, you know, ethical claims for the rights of people to move, particularly when they're the people who are least responsible for climate change, you know, for the kind of complex emergencies that they're fleeing. Um, and how do we make claims on national government to plan for, for you know, mass population movements? Because I think you're right, Mandy, you know, that um, the kinds of programs that you were describing are, are important and certainly worth advocating for, but given the gravity of the crisis, um, they're not gonna be enough, and we really need to have plans on the table about shifting people away from cities, um, you know, like New Orleans and Miami, which really are not sustainable in the long term. Um, and that's obviously just here in the United States. Um, many cities are far more threatened in other parts of the world. So it's a, it's a huge task, and it's really chilling. I try not to be too apocalyptic, despite what RJ has said about, at the outset about being, oh no, this is so depressing. I, I do, do try to stress the possibilities and how, you know, um, in a similar vein to Naomi Klein's argument in This Changes Everything about how this climate crisis offers the possibility for really kind of continuing the um, struggles for social justice and decolonization, which uh, have been part of the 20th century. You know, I want to stress the same kind of thing that, uh, the, the, the threats that cities face have to be seen as an opportunity for really radical um, mobilization. Um, does anybody want to make one final comment before we go to questions? I want to make one comment because I think it's relevant here is in my experience so far working with this, the cities that we're working with on adaptation, they're still very much chasing the money, which I think is a key theme in your book. Um, and I think it's been largely because from their perspective, I mean, I'd like to think that the city governments don't all have nefarious objectives, even though there might be some operatives, you know, behind the scenes that do. Um, but, um, but I think they're chasing the money because they're trying to figure out how to fund and how to proceed with adaptation activities, which aren't, your typical bankable project. And so how do you get the huge amounts of money or resource, if it's not money, mm -hmm. to undertake these really comprehensive large scale retreats or seawalls or even if it's green infrastructure, um, all of this is very costly. So it really um, requires a complete overhaul that you've alluded to in terms of how city budgets are designed. You know, right now we're still very much working on the business as usual, annual plan, uh, or, you know, annual budget passed by city council, five-year master plan, 30-year mortgage. You know, we're still kind of got these constraints that we're working with. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I really think that we need to stop, the cities need to stop chasing the money and finding out where it is and how to create an investable project that has a return on investment so people are interested in it. When the return on investment might be seen next year if there happens to be an extreme storm, or it might not be seen for 40 years. And so, you know, how do you um, amortize that? So I think that the crucial fact that you're hitting on in the book and that I think I see in our work with cities and their struggles is very much about the scale of the task and the resources needed to solve it, and whether that's financial resources, and if we're going about getting those financial resources in the right way, or if there are alternate models of you know, community or different economic systems that really need to be put into effect. And I think you hit at that in the book. Now, that's what we need to create more solutions around. Um, I'll have a very, very quick point, which is really a disguised like pitch to read the book, um, <laughs> which is on, on this note of cities is that, right, like they're in, in some ways responding to a disaster in New York is, it's hard to call it a best case scenario because responding to a disaster is never a best case scenario, but in a, you know, fairly blue city with a generally sort of robust public sphere, 
compared to other cities. Um, you know, I, I spend some time in Atlantic City. I'm from South Jersey. I don't not like in casinos, um, but uh, and and th that city is under emergency management and and you know is horribly affected by storms and people have just left. And so, thinking about this question of you know how does especially in the era of Trump when more action will realistically be taking place in cities and states. Um, and I think you you got at a lot of these questions really well and and it's the the timing worked out. Um, very well to have a book about about cities when um, that's happening is is you know in what ways can um, can a place like New York serve as a model and sort of a north star for how to respond and and what do you know the fights look like to make that possible um, and then you know what do what needs to be adapted and shifted and and sort of rethought when you're applying some of these models to other places and I think the the book actually um, yeah lends to a, a pretty good understanding of, of of what that can look like. Okay, so I think we want to open it up to questions. Um, I'm told the live stream will end.